So where will future oil supply come from? Offshore is the fastest growing production area, so I decided to go see Perdido, the deepest water platform in the world. Starting one. Perdido is a very long flight for a helicopter, so everyone going out first has to do Hewitt. Helicopter, underwater, escape training. And step off. Squeeze in tight, make it hurt. They reassured me if my helicopter crashed, I wouldn't need any of this, because I probably wouldn't survive. But if you do an emergency landing on the water and then sink, Hewitt teaches you how to get out. Everybody ready? Yeah. Ready inside. Stand by for this. Brace, 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 brace. Hewitt was a reminder we're headed into a remote and dangerous environment. The Perdido platform is more than two hours from shore by helicopter and could power 1.7 million people per year. So right now we're 200 miles south of Galveston. We're on what's called a spar, and a spar is basically a can, a floating can if you want to think about it. So the can's hoiled down by a by a big, big weight. weight. Okay. And it just it's like a buoy. It's just floating there. So this is the deepest water platform deepest water in the world. world. We're at 8,000 feet of water. 8,000 feet. And we're producing and we have the rig on board so we can work on the wells as well. The spar rig, which is straight above us, has access to 22 wells directly beneath the spar. How long did it take to get this facility in place? I mean, from the first time you guys decided, hey, some geologist like me says, we're gonna drill here. <laughs> first of all, we have to decide you're right. <laughs> from, the, from the time we purchased the lease to the time we got first production in March, 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. What's, what's this cost? You know, several billion dollars. Several billion dollars. Yeah. So this is the brains of it. This is their control room. This is where we'd control the movement of the spar. Gotcha. So we actually have one of our engineers in New Orleans that we're connected to. So if we have a problem, we can actually use people from onshore to help support us. That seems like a pretty critical and important function then. As, as the platforms we're getting to are more and more remote, I think it's more critical. It's tough to get help out here if you needed it. I mean, fresh on the minds of people, of course, is the Deepwater Horizon accident. Um, describe for us uh, how, how, you, how, how you see that uh, incident and, and what Shell's been doing to make sure that those kinds of things don't happen. I think it taught us all a lesson. And what we've seen now is uh, a group of companies basically create uh, the tools needed so we, we have the subsea equipment ready to respond to a blowout event. Okay. Uh, other than, than that, I think we can use remote monitoring if we identify issues or problems. You know, we, we can help respond to those quickly. Right. Uh, Shell has never had an incident in, in any of their deep water fields. Yeah. <laughs> knock on wood, but yeah, no, but, but not just knock on wood. Right. We we take a lot of steps to do that. You know, a very good, very good yeah. safety record. But it only takes one. You know, the human element's still there. We've got lots of really good equipment that protects us. But if things line up just right, you know, terrible things can happen. So you you, you do your best to make sure that those things don't happen. Sure. It's true that in 60 years of offshore drilling. Accidents like Horizon have been extremely rare. But as we push into more challenging environments, here and around the world, the risk will increase. Future oil supply 
will be hard. But supply is just half the equation. What about demand? I went to see the Richmond Refinery, which powers three million people per year. Gasoline is uh, about 50% of what we make, and there's many different grades of gasoline depending upon the season and where they're being sold. Jet fuel is the second largest product we have. It's about 20% of our, our products late. And then diesel fuel. So mostly fuels and certain kinds of lubricants and things like that. Yep. We ship product over to a marketing terminal, and the trucks that will deliver right to gas stations will pick up from the marketing terminal. We we'll also ship product by pipeline. It goes to the airports around here locally, or it goes uh, throughout the state by pipeline. Richmond makes 25% of the gasoline and nearly 70% of the jet fuel for the Bay Area. It's something like a power plant for transportation, taking the energy and oil and distributing it through gasoline. It's not often recognized the incredible energy that you can put into a volume with gasoline. It has four times the energy density of liquid hydrogen. Mm. The stuff that we put into rockets. This fuel, fuel has such enormous technical advantages that displacing it, we've seen, is not easy. It's a miracle. Yeah. Think about it. You can go 350 miles on a tank of gasoline. 350 miles, a whole family in a two-ton automobile based on a tank that's just this big. Right. And then there's not even any residue. Yeah. There's, there's no ash, it just, it's all gone, and you fill it up again. You can fill it up in three or four minutes. It's truly a miracle, it's very hard to replace. The maximum size ship here at the Richmond Long Wharf is 750,000 barrels a day of product. 750,000 barrels. Correct. The U.S. consumes about 20 plus million barrels of oil a day. That's correct. So if you're looking at about a 30th of the daily consumption of crude oil mm -hmm. and gasoline on one tanker. Correct. Like maybe 45 minutes of what we consume in this country on that big boat. That's a lot. Puts it into perspective, doesn't it? That's a lot of consumption. But it's amazing how much demand there is. And that's just for the US. The world uses a tanker every 13 minutes. And as population and development increase, so will demand. Combine that with difficult supply and future oil will be expensive.